Thank you very, very much, Darren, the convener for the PBF. The ministers, uh, Mr. Patel, we acknowledge his contribution in absentia. Uh, Minister Batabile for social development. Minister Lengiwe Mkize for uh, home affairs. Minister Zolzo, who I believe has uh, gone to the conference already. Uh, Deputy Minister Wost Hazen and uh, Deputy Minister Tabete, thank you very much for your presence uh, this morning uh, together with the chairperson of the Trade Investment Committee, uh, John Fabs. Thank you very much. Uh, a word of appreciation to our sponsor, Multi Choice, uh, with uh, the chairperson, Nolo Letele, who's here. I may as well just sell him out to say, by the way, his uh, father used to be the Treasurer General of the African National Congress way back in the, around 1958. Somewhere. Yes, and uh, so uh, you must know that uh, Treasurer Generals can actually give rise to very prosperous businessmen from what you can see there. Thank you, Nolan. And the chairperson, the president of BBC, thank you for all your support and all the business leaders who are present, diplomatic uh, core uh, with us and all the business. Thank you very much. Deputy uh, Minister Georgia uh, uh, has left. I wanted uh, to see how she, he, she responds to Minister Ibrahim Patel's uh, slogan, hashtag data must fall. And uh, it sounds good, eh? I, I really hope we can pick that fight up. I saw the students didn't only just want the fees to fall, but the data as well. Now, these days, the issue of data is such that now I've got a grandchild who's uh, five years. He knows when Coco's data are finished because she goes, he goes to play those games and finish the data. And then, Coco, please buy more data. The data are finished. <laughs> So uh, it's an important issue because around digital economy is about ensuring that our generation, current and next generation, don't lose out on this digital economy. There's a fourth revolution coming. It's going to be based on knowledge, on digitization, on um, you know this knowledge that <clears throat> for us it was something we unimaginable. For the kids, it's two-year-old can play on your thing and look for something to can go and look into the games and, and so on. They can operate this thing with ease. At two years, there's no problem for them. That is what we must understand. It's a cultural revolution, revolution in well, it's a, it's a serious uh, uh, revolution, as we say, fourth revolution with robotics coming and all of this. It's a very important issue. So I hope it can be picked up. <clears throat> I, I hope also uh, we're going to pick it up in that conference. Um, the point that, because of time, the minister did not address was that that whole settlement with the construction sector industry is a lot more comprehensive. There's a 1.5 billion rand that's been put aside to help in the training and in support training for artisans as well as tra as, as well as inclusion uh, support for a small business as they enter into uh, into the uh, uh, construction industry. Actually, uh, we wanted that discussion to move on to include possibility of government making a contribution as well as private sector and creating the first uh, basics of what we could call a construction bank to support the industry. I hope we can still push that discussion. And again, I'm saying this as an opinion, not that it's part of the agreement at this point, but the amount has been put in there. 1.5 billion has been put out there. The point that I agree with BBC, they didn't say today, is that not all those companies who were accused of collusion are participating in the voluntary rebuild program, which is to help to be a part of this transformation. Now, BBC has called for tougher action and penalties to be levied on those who don't participate. I agree with them. The issue is you can't have a, a kind of program that exonerates uh, uh, the companies were alleged to be involved and then when they 
because they've participated in rebuilding our country and our democracy. And then on the other side, there are others who want to do the collusion, but they also don't want to help in the rebuilding of the country. They can't have it both ways. So that issue, I think we need to focus on and deal with. The other points that have been raised, uh, obviously, I think the minister to deal with, I think there's an important point raised by two people in different ways. Um, the one gentleman talked about two uh, you know, the huge uh, steel <clears throat> trading companies and talked about people who have to be founding, finding themselves in between. What happens to those people? And then I think the same issue that Paul has raised about, uh, you know, uh, big oligopolies uh, or monopolies and then you've got small people playing in between. That's an issue that I don't know what the answer should be. However, the black industrialist program is supposed to address precisely those. I think that for the black business, uh, for the black business, look at that opportunity and then come and submit those proposals to be funded, to be participating there, probably at a greater scale than what you might be feeling that you'll be squeezed. But the issue is, well, so the gentleman who spoke clearly understand the steel industry. I, 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 I could pick up from that, which was quite interesting. So the question of those black industrialists, the minister sat here and spoke about the figure that the numbers now of the projects have gone to about 77. When Minister David, uh, Davis spoke yesterday, the other day, he spoke about the numbers being 46, almost approved. So it looks like there's quite a lot of interest that's coming in. I've also heard that uh, not, not only the DFIs <clears throat> are getting involved, but other funding and investment groups are also wanting to partner so that you can expand this thing so it doesn't only become just the DFIs, but that the other uh, financial um, uh, houses are interested in getting into this thing as long as the projects are viable and are going to make uh, sense as it were, uh, business sense as it were. So I think let's not talk from a distance and cry and moan. Go in there and tell us what doesn't work. Uh, we assume that your business is going to be making business sense and therefore fundable. Then let's go into this thing. So I think let's move beyond the point of all the time, this has not worked, this is not working, this, let's go in there and make it work. That's what Black Industrialist Program must be about. It must be about people going in there and finding out why it's not helpful, why is it not working, change until it ultimately succeeds. So I would say that my approach to both those questions would be go in there, tell us what doesn't work, and let's deal with it. Of course, it also deals with the issue that was raised about DFIs. I think this issue has to be dealt with. Uh, we will be going to the commission uh, with uh, Madam Danisa Baloy, and I'm hoping that we will be in the commission where those issues will be raised. We have discussed this issue several times, and we agree that uh, it must make, you must, there must be some difference with DFIs to the usual commercial institutions. Where is the advantage? Uh, that's what you need to look at. From where we sit, it must be about development uh, of, uh, you know, uh, black industrialists funding programs that would have been probably difficult for commercial uh, institutions, uh, you know, to fund, but there must be a way where we're able to give a bit of an edge so that they can actually move on and succeed as business. So I think that's an issue. The point about EIA has been raised. It's a perennial question. Uh, we must continue to discuss it. But I like the idea of consolidating and creating a comprehensive um, uh, EIA process for a whole group of... Um, um, thank you. For a whole group of uh, programs that are across different districts and uh, across different projects so that we don't have the delay. This is one area where we get delay. Sometimes the question we always ask ourselves, where do we strike the balance between development and environmental conservation? And what will make you determine which side you fall onto? And therefore, how does that prioritization help to discipline the process of uh, you know, achieving EIA uh, approvals, uh, you know, uh, quicker. So it's an issue that does create a frustration. Uh, I always remember a friend of, of mine who spoke about, uh, you know, being forced. They were doing a, 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 a housing project, and here they were actually, they received an objection about the preservation of the 
black-headed dwarf chameleons. Something that we had never heard about, and then they gave the story of how these chameleons, at night they have to move up to the stick of the grass and sit over there until uh, the morning so that they are safe from predators, etc., etc. And he tells us how they had to go into the field shining torches to look at the eyes of the chameleons and try and get a sense how many of them are here. They had to put up a fence wire so that uh, when these chameleons go up, they must then fall over and not, you know, they will then be safe. They won't uh, be part of the project and so on. Unfortunately, after they spent two million in that whole process, then they put the housing settlement. And within the first few weeks, that whole fence was actually um, uh, vandalized and it was ripped off and so on. And that's how their two million rands uh, worth of investment had gone. So the question is that we need to look very much more closely to how do we just go beyond the question of having one company having to spend money, but understand that that conservation is actually aligned to the culture and the understanding of the people who are there. Otherwise, some of it is a requirement that, in fact, does not remain sustainable afterwards. But the delay that it causes may be a challenge. So it's a complex issue. Then um, the other issue uh, around um, the uh, shortage of capital, I think that also has been brought in. But an interesting point about uh, the state's um, actuarial department. Uh, actually, state South Africa and the Department of Social Development, the social development is welfare and population development. And so the population development part, they do work together to deal with the issues of demographics. You may well be having a point about the level of coordination, which will then mean that uh, Whatever the states are, there is a whole plan that begins to deal with it. And I think if there was enough time, we would be talking a bit more about it because Minister has been indicating to me that there are issues that have actually arisen out of this. The whole question of uh, youth dividend and whether the country has su successfully taken advantage of the youth dividend at this point is an issue that they are busy discussing. And it is a challenge that we have to look at as South Africa in general, both business and private sector, because the question of investing in the youth for the future is a serious matter that will determine whether this youth bulge becomes a dividend or a time bomb. And that's a very, very significant issue. The growth of Africa and in terms of uh, its own advantages for future investment lies on the fact that you have got so much of youth that in another 50 years or so, 50% of the youth in the whole world will actually be residing in the continent. And so the future for our continent resides on that. But I wouldn't argue that uh, the investment in the bricks and mortar and roads is more important than investing in that youth. So capital investment in the human capital is a lot more important for the future of the country because that's where a lot of new ideas and new skills, new expertise, you can invest in a lot more engineers than in future they'll go and build more bridges rather than building more bridges and saying the youth must wait. So I know you didn't say so. I'm just simply saying the point that's important is about co coordinating these issues, which is your point, which I agree with. Then uh, the minister has spoken about the issue of migration. It's a challenge. My point, which I've been raising also the other day, is that we need to also accept that for Africa as a region, you have to make sure that there are multiple centers of development. That's what's going to disperse all the African all over the continent. If there's, a, there's growth in one side, they'll all go there. Why? Because it's their own continent anyway. So they will go there, and you are not going to stop people from going to look for opportunities. It happens all over the world. But as I was making the other example, when Nigeria was growing the way it was growing, a lot of South Africans were going that way. And they go all over. You'll find a lot of South Africans in Kenya. One day I was visiting in Kenya, in, uh, in Uganda. I met a guy, hey, I used to be premier. So I said, hey, premier, how are you? And I looked at the guy, and he says, this is my home. I said, so where do you know me from? He said, no, I live in Durban. I said, Why? He says, no, I'm actually running big business. He mentioned a number of things that I know. He is, uh, he's at home there. And, and it's going to be like that <clears throat> for many people. So the issue of 
us participating in the growth and development in the rest of the continent <clears throat> is how we are going to deal with migration. One thing that's very difficult <clears throat> excuse me, is to police human beings. Human beings have always been moving. I can tell you now, it's now open that people are moving. When we're in the underground, police never used to stop us. We used to cross the borders in and out, and there was no problem. Tell me today, there's no big fights and tensions and wars and so on. What's going to make people stop moving when they think they're going to get a job if they come to Johannesburg? So that is the issue. But none of you are going to be stopped from going to Cameroon if you think that there's a big business opportunity, you'll be there. So the point which you must understand is that this migration thing is one th is a symptom to deal with it. The real issue is the economy. Economic growth and multiple centers of growth in the continent. That's one of the things that will help us. Then uh, we will take forward this issue about the PBF hosting. We do host them with the women in business, so we'll deal with it. Mr. <coughs> Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Taibosh <coughs> from Santaco. No, the ANC has not forgotten the taxes. <coughs> we haven't forgotten the tax industry. I'll ask what's the issue with recapitalization. You were not here when two days ago I was talking about the automotive sector, saying that we have met with those that sector and they are very keen in participating in this uh, economic transformation. I'm afraid though that uh, we need to do a bit more of homework, me and you, inside the taxis. Because the level of organization, the level of uh, working as a united front is weak. That's where our problem is. 200,000 owners and 300,000 taxis and, and a million dependents is a very big enterprise if we were to be able to combine them. You could literally take over a lot of the supply chains, the supply, the supply of tires, the supply of fuel, shareholding in the uh, manufacturing of cars in the dealership and in the you know, kiosk all the way coming from Johannesburg to Deben and controlling all of that issue if we're all more organized. We need to get a different mindset in the leadership of the taxi industry because they are a very successful enterprise. 16 million rands every day circulating in this thing and three, about 2.5 to 3 billion rands every year. If all of that money was harnessed in an organized setting, you are actually a candidate for radical economic transformation. Let's talk unity inside the taxi industry. So, I want to say at the end of the day, our point on this matter, radical economic transformation is the way to go. We must make sure there's growth here. We must make sure that the jobs are created. We must make sure that there's transformation. All of this is what we need to take this, organ this uh, country forward. And in so doing, <clears throat> we need everybody to look for the space in this whole big big uh, assignment. Each and every one of us must find a way to get ourselves involved, and it's not going to be possible to sit there and expect others to do it, and that's, why you are, that's when you're going to be able to go in. We're going to go into it now, all of us. We're going to discuss this issue and say, how is it that we're going to make this thing move forward? Unfortunately, although this is a very important conference, here we're going to talk uh, policies. Those policies won't work themselves into your company. Those policies will only work when all of us are then convinced that's the way we must go and therefore we practice them. So these dialogues are not just about us meeting the ministers. They're about you having to start a conversation that is different amongst yourselves. You are going to be the architects of growth, employment and transformation in our economy. Then go ahead and look at how you're going to do it yourself. The ANC is going to provide a framework in the policy discussions. We may be able to implement some, a lot of these issues. Some of them will not be successful simply because you didn't stand up. You must know that the ANC is not talking because of the ANC as, a, as, as its members. We're talking about this thing because this is the only way that's going to save the economy of South Africa. It is the only way that's going to help us rebuild this economy. It's the only way that's going to make sure that the youth that is coming up is not you know, living in despair. <clears throat> As I was walking out of the uh, restaurant, I met one young fellow. He says his name is Gifilwe Mukwena. He, 
he, he, he lives in that Ward 27 where the hotel is. And he just walked to me and says, you know, Baba, where I come from, people have got no hope. This economy needs to be fixed. Otherwise, we're going to turn against you because we don't know where else to go. And I looked at this youngster and he says, please, I've gone to school, I've been educated, but I can still find a problem in getting a job in this economy until you let us fix it. We don't know what to do. And the point is that when we talk about radical economic transformation, we must know it is not just because there are populists here who want to you know, uh, appear radical and so on. We've come to a point where we've looked over 23 years and we've said there's something that is outstanding and is glaring, and that is the restructuring of our economy. And it must happen. And so the point of these discussions is to say you start that discussion. Business is good because you can do something where you are and make a change. So go ahead and make sure that this transformation happens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Treasurer General. Now, they uh, say that the first shall be last, but in the case of multi-choice, they are first and last, okay? Because <laughs> we started with Calver, and I'd now like to, uh, the Treasurer General has acknowledged uh, uh, Nolu Letele, Chairperson of Multi-Choice, um, but from our side, Nolu, also thank you very much for your support. We appreciate it, and uh, the last word will be yours, please. <laughs> 